Well, I'd like to uh, introduce Charlotte Self, and Charlotte is with the uh, Citizens Utility Board, and she has uh, agreed to talk to us and tell us about uh, the Citizens Utility Board and what they do. Uh, she joined CUB in 2020 and has a background in energy efficiency, advocacy uh, for environmental justice and community education. And I mentioned to Charlotte that she's talking to quite a few people here who work, used to work for PGE. So she's aware of, of uh, who we are and she's gonna take it easy on us. Uh, I uh, would also like to mention that uh, we're going to have Catherine Thomason, who is with the Oregon Coalition for an Environmental Rights Amendment, talk to us for a few minutes at the end of this meeting about, about what they are up to. Uh, Charlotte has said, I think you can ask questions during her presentation or after. She's, uh, she's okay with either one. Charlotte, it's all, it's all yours. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, yeah, it's great to be here today and uh, happy to talk to all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick so that you can see some visuals while I talk. All right. Looks like that's running all right. Um, so yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me again. My name is Charlotte, as Mike mentioned. Uh, I'm the Outreach and Communications Director over here at Oregon Citizens Utility Board. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, so CUB is short for Oregon Citizens Utility Board. Um, CUB was founded 40 years ago. This is actually our 40 year anniversary year, which is very exciting. Um, and we're an independent nonprofit organization that advocates specifically for residential utility customers. So in other words, the people of Oregon. For 40 years, we have worked to keep Oregon utilities affordable, accessible, reliable, and clean. This is a really special organization because we were actually founded by a grassroots ballot initiative back in 1984, which means that the people of Oregon found the work that we do so important that they put it on the ballot and voted in support of it. Today, we're a team of analysts, organizers, e economists, advocates, um, policy experts, and communicators who really are passionate about how utilities can make people's lives better. Now, before we were founded, um, everyday people, residential utility customers, had very little representation or power. Um, so we work within uh, the for-profit utilities in Oregon to make sure that all of the people actually have a voice and are represented. Without a watchdog like us, um, CEOs and utilities had a huge amount of power. Um, and back in the 80s, there was a huge problem with um, kind of that revolving door situation where you had a lot of the times the CEOs becoming regulators, um, then becoming legislators, creating laws and kind of having this you know, feedback loop that was really great for shareholders, but resulted in higher bills, more pollution and fewer consumer protections. So back in the 80s, we were founded by voters through a ballot initiative to create an independent nonprofit. We're not funded by the state. We're totally an independent 501c3 that is free to represent consumer interests to help balance that power. And that legacy continues today. Um, we focus really on making sure that customers are represented because we believe that all Oregonians deserve access to the utilities that help them thrive. But we also understand that even today, residential customers, the people in Oregon are at a disadvantage. Within the profit for-profit utilities in Oregon, um, customers often have a hard time matching the resources of these large corporations. Um, that's not to say that we're you know anti anti utility at, at all, um, but our job is really to balance that power. We know that you know as a company, utilities have lots of money, lots of lobbying power, and a lot of staff, as I'm sure that you all know. Um, to help make sure that they have their voices represented and are you know, advocating for what um, they need for business, what they need for shareholders, and all of that. 
But that also means that utility policy tends to favor corporate interests over household interest, which can have a really big and long lasting um, problem for communities. We also understand that utility issues are really complicated. You know, I'm talking to a group of engineers, so I know that you all have a lot more knowledge probably even than I do about how complicated these things can get. Um, and these systems really are built for experts, not for regular people. So one of our main goals is also to help demystify utilities for regular people so that, you know, everyday folk can understand what's going on in a way that's um, appropriate and accessible so that we can have more of a voice in the way that our utilities work. So our, our goal and our vision is really to make sure that our utilities are reflecting the needs and the values of Oregonians. We know that people value affordability. You know, the lower our energy bills are, the more money is in people's household budgets for other expenses. We know people value having access to their utilities, making sure that more people have those critical utility services. We know that people want to be able to rely on their utilities, make sure that they're having service when you need it most, um, which is always. And then the big one I'm sure that is of interest to this group is making sure that our utilities are clean. We know that utilities have a really large impact um, that lasts for decades. So we want to make sure that our impact is helping the future generations, um, as well as the current ones live in a, a clean um, environment. Our vision is pretty broad, uh, it's pretty big, but we're really visioning a future where all Oregonians live, work, and play in healthy, comfortable, and connected communities. We envision a future where all utility services are not a barrier for Oregonians, but are rather equitably distributed to facilitate resilience. And we envision a future with a sustainable environment for current and future generations. We really view this as not just a vision, but a plan of action. So we incorporate all of these, this vision and our values into all of the work we do. Um, we really think about it in uh, kind of three main buckets of the work that we do. The first is policy analysis. Our work is data-driven. We focus on our economic, legal, um, and legal experts to make sure that we're bringing in evidence-focused um, information when we are trying to create new utility policy. Um, we are also making sure that that's rooted in Oregon values. You know, we don't want to just have numbers and data um, that's just reflecting, you know, nothing. We want to make sure that it's really reflecting what Oregonians want and what we need. And that's really why our analysis is also people focused. We make sure that our evidence and that um, that data that we're collecting is reflecting human experiences. We do that so that we can protect customers' interests, we can protect our environmental interests, and we can really think about how we can equitably meet community needs um, in a way that works for everyone, including utilities. The next big bucket is engaging. So we engage leaders and community. We collaborate with all sorts of people. Um, so that's different community organizations that represent those community voices across the state. That's our members, the people who engage with us, um, either as donors or, you know, in, in being advocates alongside us. That's policymakers, people at the legislature, people um, at all levels of the, the government in Oregon, um, but primarily at the Public Utility Commission. And we also work very closely with utilities. Um, we have a really good relationship with all of our for-profit utilities. You know, even though we might not agree on everything, we all know that we're working together towards that same common goal of providing um, high quality uh, utilities, um, especially energy that people can use and that people can rely on. And then the last big bucket is advocating. So we do that analysis, we do that engagement, and then we go out and we push for better policies. We push to replace unfair and inequitable policies with ones that prioritize communities. We work directly with people to mobilize you know, our base and our partners' bases to action, um, to get people to be able to advocate for themselves. And then we work directly with policymakers um, at all levels to create a better future for everyone. 
And this strategy has worked for us really well for the last 40 years. Um, you know, we have saved, we're set to save $10 billion for Oregon customers um, this year uh, over the course of the last 40 years. And Oregon has some of the lowest energy rates in the country. Um, we don't just focus on energy. We also um, work on uh, telecommunications and we've helped expand investments in high speed internet for rural Oregon. Over the pandemic, we had some really big wins for customer protections um, and our work really helped keep utility service uh, available during the pandemic and secured more than $59 million in bill relief. And then we also have uh, a whole slate of, of successes on the climate front, um, which I'll talk about uh, today. Um, but a big one is that Oregon is set to have 100% clean electricity by 2040. So with that, I'll move on to talking a little bit more about our climate and energy work specifically. Um, and I really wanna start the, this conversation by grounding it with the people that we're thinking about. Um, this is a story that we heard from one of our supporters. Um, and you know, she said, I'm on a disability income and have health conditions that get worse in cold weather. I was shocked how high my bill went up this January and it has been so difficult for myself and my daughter. Now I can't heat our apartment as much as needed and we are doing a lot of things in the dark to keep costs down. This ripple affects my health in all honesty. I don't know how they expect people on a fixed income to be able to manage such an enormous increase in their electric bill. This takes away from our food budget. I can't keep our home as warm as I medically need it. So this is a really powerful story about the real human impacts of, of why we do this work. Um, so when we're thinking about you know, climate and energy, there's a lot of things that we're thinking about beyond just the livability of our planet, but it's that trickle down effect, right? And that's why we really think about consumer climate protections at the same time as consumer protections. So we're not necessarily a climate organization, but we have prioritized the climate since our founding because we understand the real lived impact of what that means for people. So we create a values-based analysis um, to really form economic arguments for climate action. As you saw in that story, the economic impacts um, and people's lived realities can have a really big impact on them. It can mean the difference between heating and eating, um, and it also is continuing to get worse as the climate is, um, you know, facing a climate emergency. So when we're thinking about joining these climate protections and these consumer protections, there are some three big buckets that we're, we're considering. Um, lowering bills. So climate change rises bills. I mean, those of you in a lot of uh, Oregon right now are feeling this big heat wave and a lot of us are gonna have much higher bills because of this extreme weather. When we're thinking about those climate protections that we need, a just transition lowers bills for people. Um, it gives people access to more efficient energy and it also helps prevent us from having continued uh, extreme weather as our climate changes. We're thinking about how long these impacts are. What we do today in building our utility infrastructure often lasts 50 plus years. So we wanna make sure that we're investing well now so that people are not um, stuck with these systems that still don't work 50 plus years from now. And then we're also thinking about the overall economic risk. If utilities don't transition now in a managed planned way, it's gonna end up costing a lot more later. And so we need to make sure that the what we're spending our money on, what we're spending customers' money on is effective and really future looking. One really good example of how we've combined these is the closure of the Borkman coal plant. Um, so back in you know the early 2000s, Cub started looking at ways that we could phase coal out of Oregon. We tried a bunch of different stuff. Um, but in 2008, we really were started um, on this process. Um, in 2008, we, alongside many other stakeholders, were successful in getting the Public Utility Commission to reject Pacific Power's proposal to build another new coal plant. Um, so we thought, you know, 
man, it's clear that climate change is a problem. We know that the electric industry has to confront this. We've already seen that, you know, we have the tools to be able to say that investing in new coal plants is not the right answer for customers. Um, but then we realized that, you know, we could probably use some of these arguments to close a coal plant. So around that same time, back in 2008, um, Portland General Electric was really trying to figure out how it could comply with air quality rules, um, so the regional haze rules. Um, they were requiring Boardman to reduce its emissions of uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxides that contributed to that regional haze. And to be able to keep the plant and also meet these climate standards, it would have required a huge retrofit. Um, that would have cost around $500 million. So, you know, we were looking at this, you know, the situation with Pacific Power where we had been able to stop um, customers from paying for a new coal plant and had to really think about how we could make it possible to stop hundreds of millions of dollars from going into an existing plant. Um, at the time, this was unheard of. There was an, no other example across the country of a coal plant closing, um, but it was clear that, you know, a massive investment in a retrofit for this coal plant would be something that we would all regret. So Cub really led um, a huge coalition of, of folks, uh, which is pretty rare at the Public Utility Commission, which is a, a pretty small agency. Um, and, you know, we created the economic models. We we modeled out like what it would cost, um, alternative options, uh, the long-term implications of what these retrofits would mean. And we're able to actually get PGE to agree to voluntarily co close Boardman. Um, back in 2020, it finally closed. The agreement was reached in 2010. So we you know, had this agreement and then had this beautiful long transition to close Oregon's last coal plant. And this is really special because it's the, you know, there were so many attempts to close Boardman over the years um, from climate angles and from different, um, you know, different environmental organizations. But marrying that economic argument, the consumer protection argument with the environmental, that climate protection is something that we've seen successful again and again. This is just one of many major victories um, and one that we're definitely the most proud of. And so we do this work on a variety of different levels because we know that we have a lot of different options um, for work that we can do. And we have a lot of um, needs for work that we need to be doing. So we work at all different levels of policy. Um, the highest level we work at is in the state legislature. We think about the Oregon state legislature because it sets the climate priorities and regulations for utilities. And so things like energy efficiency programs, emissions, setting emissions reduction targets, and what allowable fuels utilities can use for energy generation. And we've had a lot of success. Um, in 2022, we helped pass the Climate Resilience Package, which included a lot of different energy efficiency programs, as well as uh, high efficiency cooling programs um, that allowed uh, for a large amount of funding, or a medium amount of funding, um, for things like heat pump installation for low income customers, for low income Oregonians, um, and then other uh, weatherization upgrades as well. In 2021, we helped pass the 100% Clean Electricity Act, which sets the target for 100% clean electricity by 2040 um, for both Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. And then in 2016, we also um, helped pass the Coal to Clean Act, which eliminated, is going to eliminate um, the use of coal in Oregon electricity uh, by 2030. So obviously there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, you know, we're really looking at this point to make sure that we are continuing these targets, that we're continuing to think about our buildings, our transportation, um, and the fuels that we are using, yeah. um, and making sure that we have buy-in at the state level um, to guide our utilities and our policy um, where we need to go. So when we're talking about the utilities, I want to just pause for a moment. Um, you know, when we're thinking about who's being regulated, the big utilities we're talking about, um, we're talking about both electric and gas. 
and specifically the for-profit utilities. Obviously, I know a lot of you uh, work for or have worked for PGE and Pacific Power. Um, we also work a little bit with Idaho Power out in Eastern Oregon. And then on the gas side, we work with Northwest Natural, Cascade, and Davista. And the primary place we do this is at the Public Utility Commission. Um, so this is the government body, the state body that regulates our for-profit utilities. So when we're working at the Public Utility Commission, we are looking at um, utility resource planning, what infrastructure that utilities are investing in, um, this being, especially those that are being passed along to customers. And um, one of our big priorities at this point is limiting the expansion of the methane gas system, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. And so when we're thinking about all these things, we have these really big cases. Um, on the electric side, there's uh, the clean energy plans that are planning to get to that 100% clean electricity by 2040. And then the climate protection program, um, which is still in a, a little bit of a rough phase, but that's what's directing um, gas utilities to reduce emissions likely by 80 or 90% by 2050. Um, we've got a lot of different resource planning happening um, that also impacts the infrastructure that the utilities are investing in with integrated resource plans. These are a, a forward looking um, plans that are filed every few years um, that focus both on the next couple of years of investments, but also the next 20 years and projecting out. And then we also have uh, what's called general rate cases, which is where utilities are asking um, for approval to charge customers money for things that they've already done um, and new programs like um, subsidies that customers pay for to expand things like gas system. So we've got these big buckets. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We're pretty busy over here. Um, but I want to focus a little bit on this regulation side, um, since this is kind of the day in, day out of what we do. So once we pass a law, uh, help pass a law at the legislature, that's not definitely not the end of it. Uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that the implementation of that law is really going through. One of the big things that we're working on right now is implementing the 100% Clean Electricity Act. Um, so making sure that utilities are on track in planning for how they're going to meet this, um, on track for their uh, emissions reductions, and that it's being included in their larger, longer term um, resource planning as well. We're also looking at um, transportation electrification. So moving towards electric vehicles, um, making sure we have the charging infrastructure to support a rollout of electric vehicles um, in a way that makes sense for customers and utilities. And then also planning the resources so that utilities have capacity to support those EVs once they're online. And then we also work a lot with energy efficiency. Oregon has some of the best energy efficiency programs in the country. Um, and we like to think that we're pretty, uh, pretty well involved in, in that reason. Um, so we're thinking about demand response, smart grid, um, how different, you know, how different utilities can plan on the spot and adjust the, the load to respond to things like extreme weather. Um, but then we're also thinking about building upgrades. So in the home, in businesses, installing heat pumps, doing weatherization, and just overall reducing the energy load. And these are things that really impact all of us. Um, you know, these this impacts our ability to pay our bills. Um, we want to make sure that while we're doing this, we're thinking about affordability, but also that it's, this really is something that's impacting both current and future generations. So thinking about these climate issues as things that are our lasting legacy. On the gas side, um, we are working uh, to implement the Climate Protection Program, which came out of an executive order on climate back in 2020. Um, that's still a little bit held up in the DEQ, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality rulemaking right now. Um, so if you're interested, I can talk a little bit more about uh, how to get involved with that specific issue. Um, so there's gonna be a public comment hearing coming up in the next month or so. Um, so making sure that we have good rules uh, around that, um, and that's what's directing our gas utilities to reduce emissions um, over time, likely 90% over 
um, and it's by 90% emissions reductions by 2050, uh, or at least that's what the original rules were, but we're again still in, in rulemaking a little bit. Um, and then also making sure that as those rules are announced and that we, as we, you know, they're solidified that our utilities, our gas utilities are actually integrating those goals and those targets into their plans, into their longer term resource plans. We're also looking at gas system expansion. So how utilities are building new pipelines and how they're adding new customers. This is something that we're particularly interested in because new pipelines have a useful life of, I believe, 50 or 60 years. So any new pipelines that are installed right now are going to be still in place, you know, possibly into 2080, um, which is a really long time. And as we're seeing more climate, um, you know, climate programs unroll and more emissions reduction standards uh, roll out, we're also seeing that expanding the gas system is not something that we are seeing as a benefit to customers. Um, so we are not uh, necessarily fighting, you know, for removing gas or anything like that. Um, but we are taking a really critical look at what customers specifically are paying for and if it's in customers' best interest to continue to expand and, and grow the system with subsidies specifically. Um, and then we're also looking at building electrification and energy efficiency for gas systems. We're thinking about moving customers to electric appliances um, because we are seeing increased financial risk on the, on the gas system. Um, as we know that our utilities are really struggling to figure out how to meet emissions reduction targets. And we're also thinking about how we can support building upgrades um, to really make sure that they're working for the people in them and that they're working for people for a long time. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you all can get involved, um, but I will pause and Adam, if you have a question. Yeah, you, you were talking about emissions reductions for the gas utilities and there's a target of 90%. I, I just, do you have any examples of what they would have to do to hit that kind of a reduction? Yeah, um, there's definitely a lot of options. Um, you know, some of the things that we are looking at are, um, you know, switching to uh, renewable natural gas is one that um, gas utilities are favoring quite a bit right now. Um, we're also looking at ways that we can reduce the overall need for gas in general. Um, so though that's where that energy efficiency comes in particularly, um, they also, you know, making sure that the gas systems themselves are a lot more effective. Um, so the energy efficiency on the utility end of things, um, is a big one. Um, and then electrification is one that we're really looking at. Um, you know, it's a pretty easy way to reduce emissions if those, uh, that load is reduced. Um, overall. Well, yeah, sure. If they sell 90% less gas, then, <laughs> but I don't, I don't imagine the utility would be very happy about that. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it, honestly, it's, a, it's a really big struggle. It's, it's something that, um, that the gas utilities are really struggling with right now. Um, as a part of the original climate protection plan, um, or climate protection program, um, there were also some options for uh, utilities to invest in uh, what were called community, oh, community, I don't remember exactly what the, what the acronym was, um, but there were like credits that um, basically would equate to reducing a certain number of therms uh, or a certain number of, um, or not therms, a, a certain number a certain amount of emissions and it's been a minute since they've changed the rules and <laughs> just trying to pull this out of my brain a little bit um but i i believe it was like a, a I'm, I'm not gonna guess um but one large amount of of emissions production um by purchasing a credit and those credits would go directly back into the community um for things like energy efficiency like low income weatherization um and different, different options that helped um, communities figure out how to reduce their own emissions, as opposed to having the utility have to be the one to come in and, you know, 
invest in renewable natural gas or synthetic methane or you know whatever they're proposing. So things that would actually benefit direct communities um, and count towards those emissions reductions as opposed to that direct emissions reductions from the utility. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that we talk about amongst ourselves here at times is the difficulty that electric utilities have in building new transmission lines to bring the power to market. Uh, does uh, CUB ever get involved with that? It's, it's a, a thankless task to try to route a new transmission line. Yeah, um, we do a little bit. That's something that we will get involved with in resource planning. Um, and then also once, uh, you know, once the utility is um, trying to put the new transmission into customers' bills is when we'll get involved. Um, you know, while we are, we do a lot, <laughs> we definitely have our, our hands in a lot of buckets. Um, one of the things that we know we don't have expertise on is land use. So in a lot of ways, um, we just aren't able to do a lot of work on transmission because so often a lot of the issues does get into that land use portion, which we just don't have the expertise to weigh in on effectively. Yeah. But it's definitely something we're aware of and, and tracking and trying to help support policy that um, creates good pathways for utilities to be able to solve that, because I know there's there's a lot of need um, for better transmission, for sure. Yeah. We have heard that uh, in a couple of cities, there's been a movement to say no new natural gas connects in the city. Uh, you, you can keep what you have, but don't don't expand. Uh, any comments on that? Uh. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the big places that we waited on on this, um, so there's there's a number of cities in Oregon that have been working on this. Um, Eugene is the big one, uh, but we've also got Ashland and Milwaukee, and I believe Corvallis is starting to have some of these conversations. Um, the way that cities are have been approaching it is a little bit stalled out. Um, I'm sure that you all heard about the Berkeley decision, uh, both last year. Um, this California's uh, some high level court um, ruled that uh, Berkeley in California, um, that their law to ban new gas hookups um, in new buildings was uh, illegal. So since that law got struck down, it's been a, an interesting challenge to for um, cities across the country to figure out how to address um, the emissions from natural gas to address the fossil fuel use in from you know methane, while also complying with the law. Um, so before that <laughs> that big challenge um, came up last year, uh, Cub was involved in specifically in Eugene. Um, so we've done a lot of modeling on. Um, what the economic impact would be to customers if the gas system was to continue to expand. Um, and what we're seeing is that it just financially doesn't really make sense for customers. Um, we've got a situation where it's becoming a lot more expensive for gas utilities to operate because they have these emissions reduction standards. And Adam, as you, your question illustrated, like they don't really have great pathways to reduce those emissions. And a lot of them can be really, really expensive. So we're seeing a situation where gas prices are going to continue to rise. We've had already had a very volatile uh, methane market. And so, you know, over the past couple of years, the cost of methane has um, increased, I believe, like 50 percent um, for, for residential customers, at least. Um, we're seeing a future that's looking very unsteady and quite expensive. Um, and we're also seeing a very large movement of individual people deciding to switch their individual homes away from the gas system. So we have this perfect storm of people voluntarily leaving who are probably gonna start leaving as the prices continue to go up. And as those prices continue to go up and people start leaving, what we're gonna end up with are the people who can't leave. Um, so people who are renting, folks who can't necessarily afford to have these upgrades um, to, to switch away from gas. Um, people whose homes are, 
you know, maybe need electrical updates before they're able to make those switches and those are just too burdensome. Um, and so we're gonna have a much smaller customer base with fewer financial resources, shouldering the burden of a much larger cost gas system, um, which is, is risky. That's something that is, is definitely not good for the people who are already struggling the most. So we've taken that analysis and presented that to um, you know, Eugene City Council. We've also shared this information with a couple of other cities of really showing like, hey, the risk that we're seeing already is quite high. Um, we don't want to keep expanding the system because that risk just continues to grow as we add more and more customers uh, that will then have to be compensated when people start leaving for various reasons. Any more questions? Well, oh, I have a comment, I guess. It, it just seems to me like on a long enough time scale, there's no way for a gas utility to operate in a, you know, in a way <laughs> that is going to, you know, reduce the emissions to where they need to be, you know, you know, many decades from now. So, I mean, <laughs> trying to make a plan to like, close up a utility it seems like something that's just not going to fly but it's something that we need so like it just seems like a giant chasm that uh is going to be impossible to cross and i just you know somebody's going to be you know in you know crunched by that and it's probably going to be the lower income people or the people that you're at directly advocating for um yeah. and so like it just it just seems like, you know, it's like the, the slow moving disaster, but it's like inevitable. <laughs> I just don't know what's going to happen. And I know you're thinking about that, but it's like, are there actions that you're specifically taking to try to lessen that impact? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, a lot of them are, a lot of the things that we're supporting now are increased energy efficiency um, programs and specifically heat pump. Um, programs for low-income customers. Um, so we do that uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, you know, we've got the the big looming elephant of gas, uh, you know, kind of hanging around always. Um, and so the earlier we can switch folks over, um, the better, right? If we can get the folks who are chronically tied to the gas system with the fewest resources to leave, um, you know, when things get hard, if we can get them switched now, then that's going to prevent them from ever having to have that, that issue in the future. Um, but also we know that having these resources, like specifically heat pumps is um, is a big one that we're, we, we're always pushing. Um, it's also a climate resilience issue. You know, on days like today, I mean, it's crawling up to 100 degrees here in Portland where I am. Um, and a lot of people don't have AC. So being able to have both a higher efficient, non, a eventually non-emitting, um, you know, source of heat that also cools is just something that's really, uh, really important. Um, we're also looking at you know, making sure that any emissions reduction from the gas side of things also includes community, those community credits and really pushing the utilities to invest in those credits first so that communities, um, especially communities with low incomes, can be able to decide for themselves how to spend money, how to make investments that support their lives um, and their futures without the utility having to make that decision for them. Because um, obviously a gas utility is always going to try to expand gas, right? Um, just like electric utilities always going to try to expand electric. That's not inherently bad. It's just kind of business, right? Um, so investing in, in real dollars, going to real people um, is our big priority. And then making sure that um, as the gas utilities are making investments, that these are investments that make financial sense um, and that are grounded and based in reality. Um, and even before they start spending the money, making sure that their plans are grounded and based in reality. Um, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that the gas utilities aren't planning realistically. Um, instead of, like a lot of them aren't even considering electrification as a model for reducing emissions. Um, they're not 
thinking about investing in those community credits. Um, and what they're really leaning towards is heavy investment in renewable natural gas, um, which we recognize is necessary to some extent. But they're also looking at um, a lot of products that just aren't either aren't available or not widely Are you talking available. about hydrogen injection? Um, I'm specifically talking about synthetic methane, uh, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, hydrogen injection is is one of those as well. Um, I don't understand that one at all. That one completely loses me how, how it makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that they're modeling it, they're trying to say that they can get up to like just some ridiculous percent blending for hydrogen specifically. I think they're, I think I saw one estimate as high as like 20 or 30 percent um, when most most experts say blending at about 5% is the highest you can safely go. So, yeah. So, I mean, really, yeah, a lot of, a lot of what we're looking at is just making sure that there's not not these plans out there to overinvest in, in technology that either doesn't exist or doesn't match expert opinion or is unrealistic or is, you know, kind of just a literal pipe dream. Um but, you know, making sure that the plans match up with reality is, is a lot of what we're doing to be proactive about this. Some important work. Please keep at it. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Charlotte, uh, I want to thank you for spending the time with us and also uh, ask you, is it okay if we post uh, your... Uh, presentation on our website and also if we can get the uh, PowerPoint presentation is that is that uh, okay we want to ask before we try that yeah yeah I can send you at the my slides as well that's fine okay okay good uh well I'd like to talk with you later about anything that you know how we can work together or something or any suggestions that that would be good too uh, I'd love thanks so appreciate much. your time and um, yeah. Like to welcome then.